Good morning. I want to welcome you all into this service this morning. It's so exciting to have you here. Even as you're in your home, the presence of the Lord is there just as it is here. The Word of God says where we are is holy ground, and that's because we take the presence of the Lord wherever it's at. And so your home right now is a temple where the presence of God can come and reside, and I, I pray that you just enjoyed the worship this morning. You know, I was, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what what, where do you, what, what's the word you want to really share with the body of Christ? And the Lord just reminded me, we were in a series before a virus started, and it's not like God needs to change course, so I'm not going to change course. We were talking about a blessed life. Now, I know there will be some who say, you're talking about this at a time when people have entered an unemployment, some have lost their jobs, some aren't working, and some, listen, God has always been our provider, and he will always be our provider. Do you believe that? I believe that it's God that blesses our life and not man, not businesses, not corporations. So like never before, we need to understand the principle of the blessed life. And so there may say you're just being tone deaf and share. I don't believe that. I don't believe the word of God is tone deaf to this situation. There is a promise in the word of God, however, that I want to bring to you, and that is, this too shall pass. I, I hear this statement all the time. It's our new norm. I, I, I'm sorry, but I am not at the place of saying this is our new norm. This may be a storm or a struggle or a time in our life, a season, a short season of our life that we're going through, but I'm still a firm believer that this too will pass. And that this, which was meant for evil, really meant to destroy. We know all of this, which is meant for destruction, that God always uses it for good. He always uses the struggle and the storm to elevate us even higher and to bring us closer. And so if you're, you've never watched a, a service at Bethel's Rock, we want to welcome you in. It is so exciting to have you part of, uh, of this time and this service. One quick announcement I need to bring up, and that is last week when, when we had service, uh, I announced that uh, Alex and Lauren were getting engaged. Well, one week later, another Alex and Bianca, our, our tech director and our young adults pastor, got engaged. Apparently, if you want to get married, just come on staff and uh, you're going to get engaged in a few weeks. But for all of those that know Pastor Bianca and Alex, they are now engaged Friday night, last night, or two nights ago, they got engaged. And so we want to congratulate them as well and send them a text, let them know that, that you're glad they're, they're getting hitched. And uh, we're going to have a lot of weddings, and as some predict, we're probably going to have a lot of babies in nine months, so <laughs> I'm all for that as well. I love baby dedications, and I don't mean the people getting married. I'm talking about all of you who are watching right now that are already married. So um, let's, let's talk about some, this, this message, next message in the blessed life, in the series of the blessed life. I want to ask you a quick question. Who, who really is first in your life? Who is first in your life? Um, you know, many would say, well, my wife is first or my kids are first or, you know, the Bible's very clear. The only person who should be first in your life, it shouldn't be co-first or a co-leader in your life. It should be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit should be first in your life. Would you agree with that? I think all of you would. God must be first. God, look at this, God must be first in your life. God must be first in your life. It's extremely important that we put him first in your life. Every, every person would probably say, however, that God is first in my life. I think many of us, we get to that point where we say, yeah, God's first in my life. I, I believe he's first in life. However, the way you answer that is by looking at where you put your treasure the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure will determine what's first in your life. I mean, I can pretty much tell what's first. If I were to take a look at your credit card statement, it used to be your checkbook. 
Uh, and for those who don't know what that is, there was a day when there was actually little rectangular uh, sheets of paper that, that you would write on, and that actually would act almost like if you had cash. And cash is something they give you that's also about the same size, and it's green, and it's got stuff on it, you know. I know a lot of you only have plastic, and you're amazed that anybody would even think of doing that, but it, it actually, and some people still do it, believe it or not. Uh, but that's, that's what it is. But every time you get paid, there's a test that takes place. And every time you get paid, we take this test. We have an opportunity to worship someone with the first fruit. Because the first thing you do with that money that you're given, that increase you're given, that first fruit is your first worship. It's where you put your treasure first. And so I know there are a number of people that believe that they should tie, but don't necessarily believe that it should be the first. And, and I'm going to give you some scripture that's going to show you the importance of the first, that the first is the best. And so here's a, here's a question I have for you, a couple of questions I have for you. Do you agree that God deserves the best? Do you agree with that? You can say yes wherever you're at. Do you agree that God gave the best in his son, Jesus Christ, to you? Yeah. Did you ever stop to consider? God gave his best to you, which, by the way, is far greater than any best you'll ever have. Do you agree that God, through the covenant, gave his first son? Yeah. He gave not only his best, but he gave his first Son, do you agree God wants to give, give our first, for us to give our, our first to him? See, I, I think many of us would say, yeah, I think God wants us to give, us, give him his, our first. And yet there's, some, there's this battle in us that wants to avoid that because that's like the big deal. That's like the, the best. I don't think God wants to settle for leftovers. Do you think he's a leftover type of God? I think God's a God of abundance and that he can't even accept leftovers. That, that it's not within his character to even accept leftovers. Last uh, couple of weeks ago, we talked about tithe and, and it belongs to God and we're to bring it into the storehouse. And, and if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to do that. Um, this week, we're going to talk about the first fruit, the first check the first uh, thing we give out of the increase that God gives us. I want to go to Exodus chapter 13. It says, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. Consecrate to me every firstborn male. How many four firstborns are there? If you're firstborn, just raise your hand. So we're to consecrate you out of, I'm a firstborn out of all, a male, and I'm a male, and so I'm going to concentrate, and this is what it says, the firstborn, first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or, or, or man or animal. Now, if you're a firstborn, you say, okay, we're a firstborn, this was of animals and even men that were consecrated of God, and if you're not going to walk in bondage, we need to understand the importance of consecrating you are going to walk in freedom, then you, then you must follow the prescription that was set up in the law. And it's interesting because in the New King James, it says, it is mine. God says the firstborn, instead of consecrate, it says, it is mine. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't cough on anyone, just so you know. They're all further than six feet away. Uh, the firstborn belongs to me. It goes on, and, and, and what he's saying, it's, it's kind of like in my house, uh, since all of this taking place, um, you know, all our girls are home, and, and then their, their, their uh, fiancé and boy, the boyfriends, they'll come over, and they're there. And so, like, before, we're, if I had a pie or cookies, I'd put them in the refrigerator, and then they were there when I came back. It's, it's like I got to say, now I consecrate this last slice of pie. It is mine. So, so don't touch it, right? Where God's saying, this is what he's saying, the firstborn or the first fruit, it's, it's actually mine. It belongs to me. So don't touch it. Or you may lose some fingers if you try to slice out that pie that belongs to me. No, that's not what God's saying. But, it's, but it belongs to him. It goes on in Exodus 13 and says this. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, 
All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want my neck broken uh, as a firstborn son. What it really is saying here and what's, what, what you have to keep in mind is if, if you have a, a sheep which was considered to be a clean animal, the firstborn of, of that uh, flock of sheep or that mother's sheep, the firstborn was supposed to be sacrificed, and then every other sheep after that would be redeemed. However, if you had a donkey, a donkey was considered to be an unclean animal, and, and in order to, uh, uh, to give the first of those donkeys, you had to do one of two things. You either had to sacrifice another clean animal, a sheep, for the donkey to redeem the donkey, or you killed the, the donkey. Okay? Does that make sense? So, so here, here is... Um, Here's the example on how it really relates to us. If you don't give it back to God, you're going to lose it anyway. If you don't give it back to God, you're going to lose it anyway. Because the firstborn must be sacrificed. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. How does that relate? The clean lamb of God was sacrificed for the unclean human donkeys. So... Uh, you're in your home, you're not in church, so you're more likely to do this. Just say, hee-haw, <laughs> that you're, you were the unclean donkey. You were born an unclean donkey, and God took a clean son, his son, who was without sin, and sacrificed his son on the cross because you were with sin, unclean, and he redeemed you, God redeemed you by sacrificing the Lamb of God. So question number one, were you and I born spiritually clean or unclean? We were born unclean. It's extremely important that we understand that you were not born righteous. You were born unclean. You were born with a need for God. See, this is what happens, especially among religious circles. We tend to think that because I behaved well, that I'm a good Christian. Because we have made this. I want everyone to hear this. We have turned this sacrifice into a religion. And we say, no, no, I'm in relationship. Stop fooling yourself. If you think for a moment that you are this special Christian because you behave well, you are fooling yourself because you're measuring yourself by a religious standard, a religion standard, not a relationship standard. If you were to stop and just think logically for a moment, how would you measure, how would you measure a relationship? It would not be in your behavior whether you behaved well. Your relationship is measured by your understanding of what that person means to you. What Christ meant to us was life because he rescued us from a sure death that we were to die. We are on our way. He saved my life. And he wants to save your life if you haven't given him an opportunity already. He wants to redeem your life. It's not about how well you behave or how good you are or whether you've done more good things than bad things. That's a religious mindset. It is about a true relationship, a functional relationship. So many Christians have a dysfunctional relationship with God. And so when you hear a message on tithing or giving like this or anything in this response. We, we sit there and we hate it. We get upset because this isn't a relationship. It's about religion and don't touch my money. And next week, I'm going to talk about just that, that whole thing and how it affects our, affects our life. Here's question number two. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? We were born unclean. Jesus was born clean. Look at this. The, the next slide. The clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be clean. We're righteous today because of the, the clean sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our life. Have you ever stopped to consider that Jesus was God's tithe? 
that Jesus was God's tithe. Did you ever stop to consider that God tithed Christ to you? And he did it when you were yet a sinner. He did it before he ever knew you were say, you would say yes. He, di he did it even when you were mocking him and when you were criticizing him and you were attacking him. He gave his best for you, even when you weren't giving anything back to him. It's not the 10%. Look at this. It's not the 10% that enables the blessing. It's the faith that enables the blessing. Why? Because when you give the first, hear this. When you give the first 10%, it is given out of faith that God will provide for the rest. It's saying, God, you're my provider. I'm going to take out the first without knowing what I have left for the rest. I'm taking out the first, and I'm going to give you the first and the best, and then the leftovers will go to something else. Too many people are giving the best to the mortgage company. It's giving, they're giving their best, their first 10% to the credit card company, and I'm going to tell you that that credit card company is not going to bless your rest. The mortgage company has no interest in blessing your rest. When you give the best to God, he promises that he will bless the 90% that's left. Romans says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He redeemed you. He's blessed you. You are blessed. Amen? He... He gave his son, and you are blessed. Now, I want to talk about the, a few, just a few scriptures on this. If you take a look at Jericho, for instance, they had, they had crossed the Red Sea. They had come to this city called Jericho. God tells the Israelites, I'm with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm with you. All, but the first city you come to, the city of Jericho that has all of these walls around it, I'm going to fight the battle in Jericho, but I want you to understand that it belongs to me. Do not keep anything in Jericho. Burn the whole thing down. Sacrifice the city of Jericho, for it is mine, and then I'll bless Every battle from that point forward, I'll bless your steps. Everywhere you go, I will bless that. But no one's to touch Jericho because it belongs to me. And we all know Jericho was that tithe. It was the first. It was the first city they came through. And yet there was a man named Achan who went in and thought, I don't know what he was thinking. He thought he, he liked this robe and he thought he'd be ashamed that the robe would be destroyed and he could have good use of it. And what would anyone care anyway? It's only a little robe. And, and maybe there was some gold and some things, trinkets that he thought would be great to preserve for historical purposes, of course. I mean, I don't know what he was thinking. The robe, like, he's not going to wear it around the city. Everybody's like, where'd you get that robe? So they're hidden in his tent. He hides it in his tent. And what good is it there? Why take something and then hide it? Isn't it interesting? What, what happens, there's no logic in it. And so he took it and hid it, and they go up to fight the next battle. They're blessed. They're blessed people, right? That's, they're a blessed people because God's blessed them, and they're going to go take the city, and they lose. In fact, this little nation that they should have just destroyed overcomes them and kills over 5,000 men and they don't understand and they go to complain before God. And, and God said, it's because somebody's touched what belonged to me. That city was mine. The first portion, portion, the first portion is the redemptive portion. You have to understand this. In our life, the first portion is the re redemptive portion. It's interesting. Many of you know I have daughters that are all in college, and, and, and they're dating people. And, uh, you know, this is a big deal. If you think um, that I'm just preaching this because we need money and we're going under, we're not going under. We, we've got money for sin. We've We've set money aside for moments like this. And I'm preaching this message because it's important for you to understand that a blessed life is a life that blesses during this period of time, not someone that re becomes recluse. But you give to God what's God's and you bless those who aren't prepared. And you say, well, they should just suffer because they didn't prepare and they weren't ready. No, we're people of God. We have a different worldview than the rest of the world. That's how the world thinks. How we think is we want to be a life that blesses, right? We want to be the 
the part of the, the, vir, the ten virgins in the Bible talks about those who were prepared when those others were not prepared. Whereas they didn't help, we want to help. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, I have uh, potentially a three daughters, and they're the most extravagant gift I will ever give any person is to give the hand of my daughter to that person. And so there are all kinds of things that uh, I do, and some people think it's overboard. I think it's just normal stuff like checking their blood test, uh, their financial, you know, backing, their, you know, all of their job, their GPA, talk to their professors, do background checks, criminal. That's just normal stuff, right? Um, but I, one thing I do do is I check tithing. Uh, because it's extremely important that um, they're tithing because I want them to be able to take care of my daughter. And you think, well, that I'm glad I didn't marry your daughter or I'm not dating. Well, praise the Lord. If you don't want to, don't. Right? I encourage that. Right? Because the man that, that will get this gift, and I think is an extraordinary gift, needs to understand something. Look at this slide. I, I want every father to get this. Why would I give my daughter to a thief? If you cannot handle the riches that God gives you, you'll never be able to handle greater riches in a person. Does that make sense? Why would I ever give my daughter to a thief? Would you? See, but we don't think when we don't bring the tithe that we're being a thief, but we really are. You're actually reaching in the offering plate and taking what is not yours. And and then this is what the Bible says. The first is the redemptive portion. So when you don't remove the first, just like Achan didn't remove the first from his tent, it brought a curse upon the nation of Israel, and it brings a curse into our life. We're not cursed, but there's a curse there that needs to be removed because it does not belong. And I hear people say, well, I'm under grace. Don't give me that in the sense that, yes, I understand God has forgiven us of our sins, but there is a principle you better understand when it comes to the tithe. Your, your money isn't under grace. And in fact, I'll talk about it in the New Testament. It talks about money and it talks about mammon. You, you have to understand the importance of that. I want you to, your finances to be blessed. Do you want that in your life? then just follow the scripture. You don't have to follow me, just follow the scripture. The, the first fruit must be offered. It must be offered. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. Remember Malachi says, God does not change. You all remember that? Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Isn't that a great promise? Yeah? Look, look at it again. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Honor him with your stuff. And with the first fruits of all of your... It's not, even, it's not even just your, the money you made at work. It was if you sold your home and there was an increase in your home, you tithed on the increase. I tithed on the increase of our home. Believe me, that was a very difficult check to write. Very hard. But that's the principle. It was in mine, and I want the rest to be blessed. So your barns will be filled with you think if I give it away, then my barns are going to be empty. The promise of God is so that your barns will be plenty. There, there will be plenty in your barns. And your vats will overflow with new wine. Because when you bring God what's, your, what's his, he, he overflows the rest. It's a promise. Do you believe the Bible today? See, the, it also says, look at in, in uh, Exodus, it says this, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. It doesn't say give. Why? Because it's not yours. You can't give something that doesn't belong to you. You bring it to God because it's his, and you're bringing to him what is already his. You know, you look at the story of Cain and Abel, and I think this is the real clincher when it comes to this scripture. And Cain and Abel... In Genesis chapter 4, look at what he says. And the process of time, and in the process of time, it came to pass 
that Cain brought an offering. See, the, the question is, we all know that Cain killed Abel, but why did Cain kill Abel? It was the first murder in the world. Why did Cain kill Abel? It all revolved around this issue of the tithe. And it's interesting because if you look at it, people struggle with defining this, but it's very simple. Look at it. It says, in the process of time, Cain didn't give the first fruit. He gave over time. He didn't give the first portion to God. He waited over time. He gave it over time. And after everything else he paid, then he paid God the tithe. It says, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the first fruit, the, the ground to the Lord. A Abel also brought of the firstborn because he was a rancher. Cain was a farmer. Firstborn of his flock and of their fat. No, 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 notice that. He gave of the firstborn of his flock, not over time, not one of the, 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 the animals in his flock, and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect or receive Cain's in his offering. Why? Because Abel gave the first fruit. Cain did not. Cain gave over time. It wasn't, it wasn't that God wouldn't accept it. It was that God couldn't accept it. Now, there's something you got to see here because God can't change, but there are some things God uh, can't do. And this is the, that eternal God can do everything. Well, the, actually, that, that he can do a lot of things, but there's some things God can't do. Here's, here's one of the things God can't do is uh, God can't change, that's true, but God can't think the way we think. Right? There's, God can't think the way we think. Uh, he's omniscient, which means he, it, it means all, and, and omniscient is the science or knowledge. God is all-knowing. God knows everything. Do you realize God is not trying to inquire anything? He's not trying to figure out anything. Like, uh, God has never said, oh, myself, I never thought of that before. Right? God, God isn't there uh, thinking, boy, I sure wish I knew how that worked, or I wish I knew why they decided, the, why, why they made that decision. God, he knows everything, so God can't think the way we think. Another thing God can't do is God can't be second. He's preeminent. His preeminence means he's first. God has always been first, he will always be first. Everything about God is first. And so the gift you bring to God must be first. It's never good enough for who it's for unless it's first. Unless it's the best. He's higher than all. He's before all. He's first. God is first. God could not accept or receive Cain's offering because it was the leftover, whereas Abel's he could accept because it was the first. Really, tithing is really one of the greatest tests to see who's first in your life. It really is. Because there's nothing more than money in our life that kind of dictates the emotions even. Like, there are people, when they get depressed, they want to go shopping because they get a high or a rush or they get this boost of energy when they go shopping. And so whenever, it's almost like an addiction. Like, I need money to be able to do all of these things that are going to bring me joy. In fact, most people said, if I had more money, my life would be better. But we know that's not true. Right? So the tithe... The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus says it this way. Leviticus says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is set apart, holy, set apart to the Lord. It's set apart to the Lord. It's not for me to decide where it goes. It's for the Lord to determine where it goes. That's why you bring it into your, in your source. You say, well, I'm going to give it to missions. I'm going to determine where the tithe goes. Then it's not a tithe. It's yours. 
You're stewarding it. The tithe is not for you. That's why the Bible says you bring it in the storehouse. You don't determine where it goes because it's God. It's like if, if John Moon, who's sitting right down here, um, uh, let me have control of all of his possessions, and he says, all I want is control of 10% of it, and I say, that's fine. Instead of asking John where he wanted to go, I determine where that 10% goes. It's my decision. No, it's not. Not if, not if it's his do I make that decision. Does that make sense? It's God's. It's not my decision to, to do that. Now, if I had $1,000 and it was made up of 10 $100 bills, we're going to do a little math project here since so many kids have been out of school. We're going we're gonna to just do a little sharpening math project here. If I had $1,000 and there were 10 $100 bills, which of those $100 bills is the tithe? They're all sitting there. The first one that goes out is the tithe. The very first one that goes out is the tithe. It is the redemptive portion. It is the first fruit. I want to, if you haven't already figured this out, I want to make it really clear. Here's, God does not accept leftovers. You know what I love about that? Is if God doesn't accept leftovers, he also doesn't give leftovers. That God gives, and, and it's proof in his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he gave his best for me. That we live in a kingdom of best, not leftovers. And that as we give our best, and God has already given his best. Malachi, God says, bring the, the blind and the lame animals. I do not accept them. I'm not accepting leftovers. Exodus 13 says this. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Now, I want to stop before I go any further in this and just say this. God's also not, this isn't a legalistic thing either. It really is a heart condition. If, if for some reason um, you get paid on Friday and, uh, and you pay your bills on Saturday, let's just say, and, and you were on, uh, on a business trip for the weekend and you got paid Friday and you weren't able to pay the tithe and before you knew it, your wife went out and bought groceries out of that and the first went to buy groceries and you're sitting there, oh no, Our, we're cursed. Our finances are cursed. You just spent the tithe down at Cub Food. That we're cursed. No, don't freak out. God is also not legalistic. It's, it really, here, here's the thing I think we miss. We get so caught up in a legalistic form. This is exactly what the Pharisees did because religion is so much a part of the life of every person that, that uh, we, we tend to try to put God within the box of a religion. And, and reality is the tithe really identifies the heart. That the reason I give my first and best it's because I believe God deserves it, right? And this is why. What is this? That you shall say to him, by, strength of, by, the, by strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn and about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both the firstborn of men and the firstborn of the beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Now, I, I want to kind of give you a modern day uh, description or parable of this. It kind of give you an idea of what, what this is actually talking about, Okay. Uh, let's just pretend I'm a rancher and, and I have all of these flocks and, and that I have a son and that son goes to college and he learns everything in college and he comes back and he's going to run the company. You know, I'm getting up to that point where I want to hand it over. And so my son comes in and he's got all of the accounting practices down. He puts it all in the computer now and, and he's looking through this and he's running reports every month. And then after about six months, my son comes to me and he says, um, Dad, uh, we need to talk. And I say, okay, son, sure. He says, now I understand that you have a way of doing things, and, and uh, I'm here, and I would love to help us do it more efficiently. And um, there's a couple of things I've noticed, and I think there's some best practices 
that we need to put in place that would help us make more money. And I'm saying, okay, son, what are those things? And he says, well, there's a couple of things, not a lot, but one in particular that I just have a hard time understanding. And, and that is, is that every time um, our sheep come together, when a young sheep uh, has a baby, and it's their first sheep, you take that sheep and you kill it and you burn it. Yeah, that's right, son. Uh, See, Dad, I'm a little disturbed that you don't understand why that's a problem. Well, I don't know why it's a problem, son. Well, because you've already killed 74 of these sheep, and that's a lot of profits, and it's eating into our profits. And I I think what I would do is I would chuckle and say, yeah, son, I I need to explain something to you. Why don't you sit down? See, son, we weren't always ranchers. We were actually slaves. And uh, we were in bondage. And we were broken. And in the middle of that, when we didn't deserve it, God came and he set us free from bondage and he made us ranchers. He gave us everything that you see here. And so what I do is I let God know how important he is to me. Out of of my heart, I take the best that first and I give it to God because he's redeemed me. And just as he gave his best and sacrificed his son for me, I sacrifice the best that we have for him because it's my heart. See, I don't have a problem. Here's here's the challenge. It really is what it comes down to, whether you like it or not. I think for most people, we really don't think God had to pay too great of a price for me, especially people who've grown up in the church. They went to Sunday school. They know all the Bible stories. I know the Bible stories. I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anyone. I don't steal except from God. I'm not worshiping any gods. I I try to go to church every Sunday or at least every other Sunday or once a month. I mean, I'm really trying here. I'm really a pretty good person. I I don't, and we lose sight of the fact that we all were on our way to hell. Like every one of us were going to hell. And this is the problem. Your behavior didn't save you. Can I tell you this? You are not saved by your behavior today. You say, well, because we set this up as if when you gave your life to Christ, now you need to act better, better, and then when you act better, then it's kind of like you deserve it because I'm no longer that great of a sinner. The only reason you're not a sinner is not by your behavior. The reason you are no longer a sinner is by the, the blood and grace of Jesus Christ. He gave his best. The Father gave his best. And when we give him our best, he returns his best. And we give him our best, he returns. It's like a current or a circuit of God. When we live in the kingdom of God, we give him our best, he gives us back his best. We give him our best, he gives his best. It's it's just this current that flows. That's why our tithe isn't just 10%. Our tithe is our best, our first. You say, well, why? Why is it so important? Because when we give that 10%, what we're saying is, God, I know you'll take care of the rest. I give it out of faith knowing you'll take care of the rest, so I'm going to give you the best, the first, to redeem the rest. Does that make sense? I'll tell you what, God's your provider. He will always be your provider. He says, test me in this. He says, test me in this. Cain, Cain didn't want to test God. He didn't want to walk by faith. Abel did. I want to encourage you to follow the example of Abel to trust God. Isn't he worthy of the best? So Father, right now I pray as the enemy would come to try to steal away the seeds of scripture that have been planted in soil today. Some may be a little rockier than others, some more fertile than others. Lord, I pray that you would just keep the birds away, that the seed would take root 
and where maybe this has not been a practice in people's lives, Lord God, that they would test it and find the truth, find the blessing in the practice of the first fruit. Lord God, that there are millions of people around the world that have learned that you deserve the best and they've been giving you the best and you've just so completely set them free in their finances. Lord, I pray that those that are listening today will discover the same truth and principle that could set them free in their finances, that they would believe that you truly do redeem the rest. Thank you, God, for your word that brings life. Even though it contradicts other things we've heard in the world, thank you, God, for a word that brings life and light into every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.